Hey, Michael, welcome back on the show. Um, before we get started, uh, we have a lot of new uh, subscribers to the podcast. Could you briefly introduce yourself to the listener, provide any updates since your last episode? And we'll go from yeah, there. Definitely. My name is Michael Tinglin. I am a design leader and designer located here in Dallas, Texas. And I have a passion for all things UX and product design. A lot of the articles that you're sharing on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and for any context, first call to action, follow Michael on LinkedIn. He's a curator of a lot of interesting articles. I try to be. You're just like a tastemaker. You don't really say much about it. You're just like interesting. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Like when, <laughs> when you pull up the articles yeah. and uh, I always like what you share. Um, and a lot of what you're focusing on right now is AI and product, which is top of mind for yeah. everybody. My current journey is focusing on how does a designer adapt to the next tech gold rush that's happening right now? What have you learned so far exploring AI and where designers fit into it? Let's see where that yeah, goes. Definitely. So I think our last meeting, we focused on UX is not a magic bullet. So I will start off by saying AI is not a magic bullet. <laughs> Once again, I'm going to keep that theme going. Um, you know, let's talk about our state. AI is not new. Okay. It's interesting impact that generative AI has had in roughly the past year and some months, because it's for those of us that do video, audio, or any other type of media, we've started to see these tools rolling out from 2017. So it's not new in the music world. There's been core generators and text to audio that's been going on for years. And then in the video world, there's always been AI at different levels for different types of plugins and effects and editing techniques. So it's interesting now that it's kind of getting out of the cutting edge media world and it's being used by everyone. Marketing was way ahead of this. People in marketing were using AI to help them craft campaigns and do ad buys five, six years ago. So this is not new. It's just another level that's new. What we're seeing is really the generative and the chat bot not being as dumb and as annoying as they have been for the years. A lot of people have given up on the assistance on their phone. And of the home assistants and the pucks like Amazon Alexa and Google Home. I know a lot of people who have them, like myself, and even done some development for them, but they don't use them much anymore. I think this is a reinvigoration of AI is the best way for me to describe it. But I think we're just at the beginning of yes. this phase, which I think will be towards the mass adoption phase and not just a pro user adoption. Yeah. In college, I did a class on voice user interfaces and a lot of it's just decision yep. trees. A lot of historical AI was really just decision trees in the back end. Mm -hmm. And then if it was sophisticated, it was just machine learning. Right. And then a lot of AI experts are saying that like chat GPT-4 is really just a large language model, which isn't general intelligence. It's still only as good as what you prompt mm -hmm. it and it is able to reason based off the, re the data it has to come up with some pretty compelling and, so, and, and a lot of times uh, false answers. And yeah. so we're not at min minority report. No, and I was watching an expert the other night. His take on it was it's really predictive text on steroids. It's like autocomplete on steroids. And there's a book about the two types of reasoning. One is intuitive and the other one is deliberative. So one is called fast and one is called slow. And it's yeah. doing, it's kind of being intuitive. It's just trying to autocomplete and guess what you want um, versus it being deliberative and doing true problem solving. So we're just not there yet, um, but we will probably be getting the debate on when is all over the map. But there's a couple of things I've learned in the past year or two in particular and deploying some AI projects. One, the expense is and the infrastructure needed is way more than people understand. Um, a lot of companies are taking a loss by even trying to have services. They're just trying to get users right now. They're in a growth mode. Um, but it is very expensive. The compute power needed and the amount of cloud infrastructure needed is what's driving the biggest expenses. Hence the big investment uh, Microsoft put into OpenAI and uh, also allowing use of the Azure system of the Azure platform. So that's to just let you know just how much it is. So that's for LLMs though. And I do uh, have a distinction um, and I've been studying AI for a while uh, since the nineties. I think that small language models and edge computing. So on device AI will be what is really mass adopted by most people 
enterprises will be the ones that will be using cloud infrastructure and the large um, backends and, and um, uh, processing compute needed with APUs to do, to be honest, much more sophisticated work than the average user is going to want from AI. And so what does this mean for product people in general trying to make things that resonate and solve problems? Mm -hmm. And I see a couple angles here. One is there's a product sense that you're hinting at that throwing AI into your product isn't free. No. You're, you get to plug into an LLM infrastructure mm -hmm. that is powered by some big tech company probably. Mm -hmm. And then two, it's how do you approach the design process to make something interesting? I know I'm setting you up with double questions, but no I worries. feel like you could handle it. So there's a couple angles here. One, what does product sense look like in the AI game? And two, you mentioned it's autocomplete on steroids. How does using that framing help temper a designer's approach mm. to creating experiences right now? Because if it's autocomplete on steroids, that's something tangible yeah. you could grab yeah, onto. Yeah. So I would say from a product management and product development perspective, the traditional starting point is set up the problem statement, what space you're trying to go after and what problem you're trying to solve and for whom. And then it's a classical build or buy, right? So I see the deployment of AI in these products as a very similar early on decision to make. Uh, one thing in deploying some features for a large product I was just working on you don't just put AI in it for the sake of it. What you will find is that users won't use it. They might try it out and then they'll fall off really quickly. So you really want to make sure that you adding it and because of the, also the added expense really brings value and uh, create some type of multiplier for the product. That's really what you want to make sure. Like, does this really help? Or are we just pulling a meat, you know, uh, I, we want to do it too type of scenario. Yeah, you, you, of course, we all want to do it, but does it make sense? And does it actually help to solve the problem for the user? And will it create some type of multiplier on ROI? Like, what's the deal? So you would have to do that from a product perspective. And you'll find out that some things you thought were cool that you wanted to do would be cool, but it doesn't make sense. <laughs> it doesn't make business sense. You're like, well, not now, okay? Maybe later on, as those costs come down, we'll see it more. But then you have to wonder... Would it be used? You know, would that really f fulfill the needs of the user? Um, for the design perspective and thinking about it as autocomplete, I think of it as autocomplete on steroids and probably the next phase of true personalization. For those of us like myself who've worked in fintech or worked in e-com, you know how important personalization can be in order to help users either get through complex processes or to make a decision, a buying decision in particular for in the case of e-com. So... Uh, surfacing things to them that are truly relevant, but not in a creepy way. I think what I'm missing in personalization now is knowing the buying history. So case in point, you and I are speaking now about this stuff. And later we're going to see a bunch of ads for AI platforms because we're talking about it now. So people view that as kind of creepy and they don't know if I haven't bought any courses or I'm not using any, but so it being more sophisticated for personalization will be a multiplier for commerce. And I think we're there now. It's something that those of us who worked in e-commerce in the early 2000s always wanted. We just didn't have the tech to do it. So we did low-level things. And that's why you had a lot of tagging and cookies and trying to go through the data and analyze it manually. So I do think from a, from a design perspective, once again, keeping the same lens up, does this help the user? And it's not just cool for the sake of cool. And, um, and I will say there's also one, yeah. other, one other thing, Caden, like, you will have people trying to say things are AI and machine learning that are not. <laughs> you kind of have that a lot now too, because it's a marketing spin. So, um, but that, that I think like, you know, I don't, I don't say this is the NFT uh, type of scenario. Hopefully not. Um, I do believe this is a true next phase of us deploying AI uh, in society and in products, but um, it could easily go sideways if we overdo it and overmarket it. Well, it's the whole Warren Buffett quote. I think this is a time to be fearful while everyone else is greedy. Yeah. And, you know, one smart thing to do is just kind of see where the chips lie, let other people make yep. the mistakes. Um, the and uh, I always wondered, um, you just made me think about something that like, I wonder if 
because you're seeing that like browsers are removing cookies. Safari did it mm-hmm. first. Google's going to be removing cookies. Um, so cookie technology has gone. Um, I wonder if LLMs is their fix yeah. for like ad, ad technology. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you could just scrape all of the posts, mm-hmm. look at all this customer's mm-hmm. posts and see what they're talking about and then be like, okay, cool. Like they, they obviously care about this right. thing. Like, target and like in um, marketing, we call that lookalike models, right? And some of that was AI machine learning years ago, 10 years ago. Um, and you were trying to create a mm-hmm. lookalike model. When we say lookalike, because it's not Caden exactly, it's people like Caden. So in marketing, it's a bigger segment because there are privacy rules. There are other rules you have to consider, right? So, um, but now to your point, especially if people are unscrupulous, they could um, be creating literal dossiers on us, like way more sophisticated than ever in history. That's true. Now, if they could be predictive um, and then we find value from that, then that's different. Then you may not mind it. I shall give you an example. It's funny to me um, because ads can be very annoying in a lot of the experiences we had, but people will have to make money and businesses have to stay in business so that they can give us the bits and services. Um, I would say, though, that the ads that I get on Facebook and Instagram are in line with my uh, interests and wants. We are in line. Mm-hmm. I was like, those are great algorithms as far as I'm concerned. They obviously know I make music. <laughs> they obviously know that I um, edit video and are involved in that. And they are feeding me all the great stuff that I want to. And so I actually will buy mm-hmm. from those ads. And that let me know, well, when ads are effective and are truly there uh, supporting the needs of the user, then they work. With the, what we have, the issue is, is when it's kind of like the shotgun mentality or the scattershot mentality and they're just throwing everything at you kind of in a dumb way. Well, Mike likes music, but it's like, yeah, but I don't play Trump. And then, you know, and then I see all these ads for that. It's like, uh, yeah, kind of. You're in a category, but not my needs. You're not meeting my needs with those. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, I think um, being proactive isn't a bad experience if, if the proactive uh, and like agent, I'm just going to use the word agent so that you can generally think about, yeah. um, you know, pe- pe- like people that, you know, if you're planning a party and you're proactively uh, uh, setting up the venue, uh, to meet like the, the jobs to be mm-hmm. done of the guests, uh, that is appreciated mm-hmm. if you, it, could, it leads to a good experience. Um, I mean, that's basically like all like the, when you're trying to like make a good user experience, that's really just what you're trying to do is you're proactively trying to, um, predict what they care about mm-hmm. and then incorporate that into the design of the product. And now, uh, yeah, like I, people complain about like ads, but I, I spent a lot of money. I have, I have to delete Instagram because I spent too much money. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I mean, Their algorithm the was great. Yeah. It, was, it was amazing. I'm like, I wanted yeah. it. I can't say I didn't right, want it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. So I can actually see where, where it is being used well and where it's not. Um, I would also say, though, from a design perspective in AI, it is something I think most designers should familiarize themselves with, even if they are. It's not their forte or they don't, you know, they're not that interested in it. They should still know about it because they will be having to design these experiences going forward. This to me, though, will emphasize currently, depending on the system that you're working on, uh, UX over UI. Right. So I could tell you some years ago, I was very worried about the uh, Alexa and Google Home Assistant getting really popular and smart, which is coming now, but we're getting really popular and and, uh, smart. And then it's like, well, there's no need for UI anymore. And I'm like, well, what? Mm-hmm. You know, because a lot of us have been engaging in that part of the design spectrum for most of our careers at some point. And so I, I can see that happening. Uh, there will always be a need for visual. Um, I would say um, a case in point is speaking to assistant. So I don't know if you saw this recent um, keynote uh, from the founder of a company called Rabbit. And they created this device called the Rabbit uh, R1. Yes, I'm very familiar. Yeah, it's uh, and and also, can you explain that to listener, uh, like kind of what it is? Yeah, and... so it's a device that this um this company out of China created uh, called the Rabbit. Um, oh, actually, the device is called the R1. The company's called Rabbit, and it's a small handheld device that you would it's like a push to talk, so like a walkie-talkie, and you would click it and uh, say something like, um, you know, send me my usual dinner. 
and it would know the context. It would know what your usual dis- dinner order is from where, and it would c- execute on that without any more instructions. And, and I thought what was interesting that they had proposed that they had been working on in the past couple of years, not a large language model, but a large action model. So this is what you see a lot of people doing when they're, char- when they're um, hooking their LLMs to automation systems like Zapier. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah. They're trying to get the AI to actually complete actions, open up programs, go into accounts, and, and truly automate a workflow, right? Which is what uh, tools like Zapier are fantastic yeah. at. Um, but uh, now it's like you could have intelligence with it, not just your intelligence running those automations, right? So it seemed like it was something like that. I thought that was an interesting point. And I don't know if it'll have legs. I pre-ordered it because it was, you know, 200 bucks, which I thought was an amazing coup on their part to uh, size up what the prices of devices were in the field today. And they showed the, the AI pin, which I thought was interesting, but it was 699. I didn't pull the trigger on that. And they talked about the price of smartphones today. And they were like, look, we're trying to make this a mass device, 200 bucks. Now, the issue we have is that people are not going to give. Well, they're probably, yeah. uh, well, they're, pro- well, they're probably trying to pull the, the, the Xbox like move where you, you, you sell at cost yes, or lower yes. just to get distribution. Yes. Right. And then they can V2, V3, they can add more functionality or whatever and raise price. So they're getting, they're, they're going for market share. However. Um, this would be another device that people have to carry with their phones. So that's going to be probably an experience blocker. Um, I don't see, uh, there's a, there was a great breakdown of it that said, man, you really have to trust this device because suppose you don't know what you want to eat or, you know what I mean? So there are some pluses and minuses to it. I think it'll get more sophisticated, just like, um, automation flows that have breaks in them. They, they, you can put breaks in your flow and have it to where it'll ask someone to confirm or to. They, they did show some of that, so there are probably ways around it. Um, but what I do like, even if it doesn't have legs, even though um, I think three batches sold out, three batches sold out, I think they were 50,000 a batch. So they probably sold at least 150,000 of these devices just from that keynote. Um, I think it will force Apple, Google, and Amazon to upgrade their assistance, and I'm all here for that. So Apple made an announcement that in the summer of this year, they would um, speak to the next version of Siri. We all expect that to be something smart, something AI, preferably, hopefully, prayfully. And um, I would assume uh, Google is going to go that route. Amazon's going to go that route. I think they might even look at that whole Puck Home Assistant um, device again, not just for phones in the case of Google. Samsung has just released their first phone that really has like that sophisticated level. So some people are like, this is a great device in theory. However, phones are going to catch up and you won't need it. We don't know of the different uses. One thing I thought was very interesting is that it had a camera on it and the camera wasn't just there to identify um, uh, objects in the real world. The camera was there so you could train it. So I essentially could have the device watch what I do on screen, do the functions between the different apps. I'm going in my browser, logging into this account, doing this thing, doing this other thing. It would learn it and then it could do it. That's, that's a new thing. That is a new thing. That being able to teach it to do something and then it just do it and it's doing it by sight. That's, I haven't seen anybody approach it that way. So what you like, you put the rabbit. Yeah. Up, like, say you have it on like your desk and it's watching facing it, your yep, screen like it's watching me on the laptop. It has a little camera that can look at me or look at the screen. Like it's a little rotatable camera. The design on it is, is amazing too. I like the industrial design of it. It's one of my favorite companies, teenage engineering shout outs. They are amazing. So they do a lot of music equipment, but they're really an industrial design firm. And their stuff is usually yeah. very expensive. So, um, but uh, they designed this for Rabbit. And I, I really like the design too. I think it's, it's uh, interesting. It's like retro futuristic. It's a little Stanley Kubrick in a little 1980s future, which I like. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the, uh, the kind of like the neon orange. Yeah. Uh, puff, puffy jacket yeah. type vibe yeah, yeah, yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that that's incredible because then that is basically you, you've you productized uh, ethnographic research. That's what I said. There's going to be, there, there are going to be uses for this device. I had, I had yeah. a fantastic research I worked with that city and he would create his own um, devices to do research. Eye scanning and eye tracking. Like he was amazing, this guy. He was like an engineer. Wow. Yeah, he was, the, he's probably one of the most sophisticated researchers I've ever had the pleasure of working with. 
And so I could easily see him going, oh, this is, I got it now. You know what I mean? You just have that set up in the interview and just go to town. And then have it run back, uh, you know, the notes. And I, I just really see some place for this regardless. Now, as I said, um, Apple and Google in particular could easily, uh, and it has this like cute little avatar, this little rabbit that like bounces and gives a little feedback to let you know things are working. Not that sophisticated, but cool enough. I could easily see Apple upgrading Siri, upgrading um, uh, their, their automation, what's it called? Shortcuts. Um, upgrading mm -hmm. emojis to be that little face of the AI and they're done. Same for Google and they're done. So I see, I do see that coming, but that doesn't mean that this, dev this device doesn't have uses and the learning aspect of it is very, very intriguing. I, I think the product of Rabbit is the uh, engineering team. Like you, usually like when, when someone's that early, uh, they're not going, like the chances of them becoming an incumbent one day is probably pretty low and, and then moving on to like a bigger incumbent to take their talents and expertise. I mean, that, that, that almost happened when Sam, Sam Altman got fired. Yeah. Is that now Microsoft just absorbed yeah, what, the talent? Yeah, but we have to look at, uh, I think, you know, in tech, in big tech in particular, we have this, you know, I, I, my social, my uh, anthropology mind and sociology mind is going to kick in now. We have these weird cults of personality. So we do have leaders who are actual engineers, doers, makers, right? Not a lot of, I haven't seen any design mm -hmm. CEOs, but yeah, mostly engineers you will see in, especially in SaaS. And they're actual doers. They can write code. They can do it. That's great. I like that. I think that's good for society, right? But um, yeah. many of them are not. And so we may overplay their importance. Yeah. Sam Altman, I don't know yeah. his background enough to know, you know, but I'm sure Sam went up late at night helping to build those models. Maybe, but I, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, the amount of speaking engagements he has, I'm de I definitely think there is delegation going on, but I, but I do know that he probably actually has a technical background. Yeah. He may be a data scientist. A lot of, like, startups. Yeah. And, and I mean, there, you know, at that level of leadership, a vision is what's important. So obviously he has a definitive vision um, and that is, that is actually worth a lot more than most people think. And um, many leaders do not have a definitive vision that a, that a company can march towards. Yeah. So that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, maybe this is a good like segue um, into like strategy and, and let me define strategy for the listener of like what uh, I think it is and based off my understanding of like the thought leadership of like, you know, good, good strategy, bad strategy, like that's probably the definitive book on like what strategy actually is. And um, I'll use an anecdote to kind of outline what strategy is not, right? So I was uh, working on, like I was working with like this proc leader, not technical, I, I, you know, honestly, I, I, there's, I kind of, one of my, uh, professional X is this persona that is in tech because tech's like the hot thing and you tech companies have like really strong financial arbitrage, right. but they don't really bring anything to the table on the house. Mm -hmm. And so this, like, they're really good at like spinning up this vision. I think like the, the perfect archetype mm -hmm. for this is, um, uh, Adam Newman at WeWork where mm. he was a really great storyteller, mm -hmm. right? But he, but yeah, so like I got, had like this Adam Newman type product leader that I was working with and I would, I'd be demoing concepts and designs and then he's like, no, 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 no. Like our goal is to big, broad, you know, vision. And then I'm like, cool. Yeah, I'm aligned with that. That's why I'm at this company. Uh, but how? You that's know? Where, that's where strategy how, and tactics come in. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That's what strategy mm -hmm. is, is like you have like a thesis mm -hmm. on how to allocate resources and like what to execute uh -huh. against. And, and, and then also let me talk about execution and tactics. Tactics is part of the strategy. Yeah. Like, like the actual tactics is it's the how strategy. you fulfill on it. Like it's like, yeah. And then execution is actually doing mm -hmm. it. And so people talk about execution being like documenting and writing PRDs on tactics. It's like, no, it's actually no, like, so that's exec that's like designing doing the it thing. And developing it and writing the code. It's that's, that's designing it and developing yeah. it and writing the code and like doing it. Yeah. And then, and then you might have it, right? 
-hmm. like agile is my methodology, but like, well, that's a tactic. Agile is a tactic, technically. It's a way of achieving that goal that leads into that strategy and that supports that vision. Yeah. And it's also like uh, sometimes like, I mean, and I don't want to beat the dead of worse. It's something I'm very passionate mm -hmm. about though, is that agile, uh, is a tactic, a headless tactic usually, yeah. right? It's just for this, like doing something for the sake of something is no, not strategy. No, that's what I was saying about AI. It's just like, just like that. You don't do it just to do it. Mm -hmm. No, you want to make sure that you're applying the, the, the proper methodology and process and workflow to achieve what you want in an efficient way because there's cost and time mm -hmm. there's no free lunch time is very precious so that's some of the reasoning for that and uh, you know i really wish um you know i grew i grew up in a time period where all the business leaders read uh sun tzu art of war and musashi book of five rings i kind of want to go back to that i really wish there was some i really yeah. wish there was some more um, and the reason I say this is because some people may not like that because those are militaristic treaties, but the reality is there's a lot of wisdom in those. And, uh, and I think we're losing that. We're lo I, I think we're losing it anyway, because a lot of senior leadership are not hanging out at companies like they used to either. There's that. Yeah. It, they're, uh, using roles as like arbitrage opportunities for the next yeah. role to increase their, their mm -hmm. income. And, and that, that's like, that's, that's a p part of my ick is that, um, a lot of, uh, especially at product leaders, um, that I've met, I've only met a few that I've been able to like, dictate like a thesis mm -hmm. of like how they think we should, we should allocate resources. The rest are just kind of like, oh, I came from this big brand and we did uh, it that way. The reason you hired me is because. Yeah, but did you design that strategy? No, probably like someone that mm -hmm. you like reported into you that you probably didn't hire because you were there for mm -hmm. one year. Yeah, there's that's maybe true. came up with that's that. That's true. That's a that's a that's a fair critique. Um, but I do think that um, you know, it's not easy. Right, we always have to have empathy for every uh, group and category of work that we're talking about. It is not easy yeah. to do. And you have to maintain a certain level of flexibility because market forces may dictate a mandate that what you all, what you all were all in on and what you thought was the way to go is no longer valid. And so you yeah. have to be able to be flexible and pragmatic. But as I said, all of these things are taught in these treaties. So I really wish more of our business leaders were less on the Tony Robbins tip and more on the actual bring vision to life tip. Yeah. Well, let's talk about... Um... You know, Book of Five Rings, uh, Miyamoto Mus Musashi, mm -hmm. who was a samurai. Mm -hmm. Like, this is written in, like, the 14 or 1500s, I yeah, believe. Yeah, I want to say 1500. You know, when... I could be wrong, but I think it's 1500. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to go on record saying I am totally pulling this out of my ass. So don't... Look it up, guys. At me. Just look it um, up. Yeah, Google it. Book of Five Rings. Um, and, and then uh, Art of War. You know... um. I just watched this Netflix series called Blue Eye Samurai. Oh, I loved it. That was uh, amazing. Was fantastic. Yeah. Love the animation. It's fantastic. It. High production value. Oh yeah, like it's uh it's like John Wick. Yeah. If you like, if you, yeah, if you like John Wick, you'll like Blue Eye mm -hmm. Samurai. You know, but the there's this great scene where the main character is this um very John Wick esque, like really good at what she mm -hmm. does, which is basically like, uh, you know, killing. I mean, and she's stuff. a Ronin. Um, and then uh, her master. Yeah, she's a Ronin, which is uh, I bet there's a lot of influence from like the Book of Five Rings oh, yeah. in there. But uh, there's a scene where she's at a crossroads and she's indecisive, and her mentor is this master swordsmith, mm -hmm. um, makes swords for samurais, and he he said, I, "Hey, I trained you to be an artist. Like I study philosophy and all mm -hmm. this stuff so I can make better swords. Like everything mm -hmm. I do." is to make better swords. And so like, there's this level of like, art. I love, like that was super mm -hmm. impactful for me is that craftsmanship. like, there, yeah, there's no, like there's no art. I think that's what yeah. you're saying is like, there's no art and strategy. It's like everything we do is to like posture that we're like big tech CEOs mm -hmm. right now. And there's no craftsmanship mm -hmm. in art that, that like everything we do and our free time is to become a better developer of products. Mm -hmm. there, there, there's not a lot of no, um, and I think it's be the stage that we're in too, right? In the in our 
in our inter- internet and information-based economy. It's the stage that we're at too. You know, people love to talk about like late stage capitalism. I even heard, a, I saw an article that said late stage UX. That's, these are interesting concepts. Um, I do believe that that has something to do with it. You have to um, move with the times, but some of it is, uh, some of it is just lazy, to be honest, right? And uh, it's also, as I say, to have empathy, it's not easy coming up with a large uh, vision or coherent strategy to execute on. That's not an easy thing. That's why they hire us. You know, that's why, they, that's why you try to find the most qualified people you can. And that's why you try to be collaborative. You want to have more minds on that problem, you know? So that's to me, some of the issue, but why I'm saying this is because I see a, a definitive lack in wisdom in some of the decisions I have seen in the past, say six years to six to eight years. And I'm just like, okay, I'm not getting this. I, if, unless you just want to be a, a real cynic. And you, then, you, then it was like, oh, well, obviously there's some other personal things going on. This person just wants, you know, make this money and move Yeah, on. like move their career yeah. forward. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I think that's, I mean, if it makes you feel better, my, my, my hypothesis and read on that situation is that it's always been like that since like the dawn of in, the Industrial Revolution. I mean, when you like listen to Steve Jobs' last interview, he talks about there's this disease in, in uh, the tech industry that like the idea is 90% of the work and that all you mm-hmm. have to do is hire a bunch of smart mm-hmm. people and say, cool, build this great idea that I came up with, right? And so I think it was like, that's what Steve Jobs was like railing against back in mm-hmm. the 80s. And, and and so like, I think it's always been that way that um, there is going to be uh, carpet baggers, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and uh, for the listener, like, if you remember in like elementary school, like history class, like it's a while ago, carpet baggers were people that uh, they had these carpet bags back in like the 1800s. And they basically would just put in the bags, whatever was the hot new thing in the market and they would go try and sell it. Right. There's always going to be like carpet baggers, people that would have been management consultants mm-hmm. 10 years ago that are now like product managers or, you know, whatever, um, that they're just chasing the high status job. Yes. And. Maybe that's always been well, the case. Well, you know, that's a motivator in society too. So let's not be naive. We have to have some of these motivators. What we're saying is... Mm-hmm. That's why I have this yeah. podcast. I'm very, I'm actually a pretty naive well, person. You know, so I'm going to have yeah, some well, well, no, 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 I'm just saying. <laughs> we have these motivators. Like I like to, I like to yeah. eat and pay mortgage and stuff. You know, that, that motivates me. I like to, I like to, yeah. have, I like to <laughs> have my music life and this equipment costs money. That motivates me. You know yeah, what I mean? Yes, so yes, yes. we know that. Uh, but what we're saying uh, a lot of the, the, the products that we work on, the platforms that we work on have definitive impacts in society, some very large impacts beyond economic impact. And so, um, you know, we think that, I think you extras and on a whole might be in agreement with this. We think that it should mean something. But it's also a catch-22. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I look back at my career. I've been involved, as I said, since the 90s. And I go, there's no permanence to any of the work I've done. I I dawned yeah. on me the other day. I was like, I, I mean, it occasionally comes to me, but I was really thinking about it the other day. And I was like, if I was a painter, I could still look at those paintings I did 20 some years ago. None of the work I've done is there anymore. Well, some of it, maybe the past six, or seven years worth of stuff. But outside of that, no. So that's another thing for us to grapple with as creatives and as craftspeople that we are in a craft that does, that lacks the permanence of previous crafts in our, in a, that we've had in time and history. You know, like, are, are people going to be selling uh, screenshots at Sotheby's in 50 years of the early internet? Doubt it. <laughs> you know, I doubted that. I was like, could that be art? You know, should I save up to screenshots and put it on canvas? Or I don't know. No, it won't. Uh, there may be some history, there may be an art history value, definitely. As we've studied yeah. different movements and design. Yeah, I definitely see that. But yeah, there's a lack of permanence in the digital domain. And I think that, you know, that's a, that's a downside. Yeah. Well, it, I think it is, uh, actual evolution, mm-hmm. right? Because, uh, the, the discipline of painting isn't as in vogue anymore. And it's usually the realm of like privileged people mm-hmm. that can have time to do mm-hmm. it now. Um, so, I mean, I think there's like a, Maybe 
what what we're talking about here is like there's a lack of permanence in the discipline, the right? Output. Like what what's like valuable yeah. in the market. So the, well, yeah. our market changes rapidly, so we could make both cases that our discipline and in the market there's a lack of permanence. But even of our output, there's a lack of permanence, right? Because yeah. we're constantly trying to improve. We're constantly trying to change it. If you're doing it right. And you're, and you're doing continuous improvement. You're constantly trying to change it. You're trying to get better at it. But even so, it's not even physical. You know, like I, I had flirted with architecture. I think we talked about this last time. I was a business yeah. major, switched to social sciences. But in between there, I looked into architecture and decided not to go that route. And I had taken uh, technical drawing and drafting in high school, which I haven't seen offered anywhere nowadays. Oh, actually, no, there's the, a few tech center high school uh, clusters that have that. But anyway, um, you know, with that, it, oh, yeah, I probably would have just been designing spec homes, but they would have been a physical thing that was there that could have outlived me. You know what I mean? So that's a, mm. that's a, or industrial design, you could have created, uh, industrial design is fascinating. But then, you know, like um, I look at, like I have a Mac studio. I love it. I think it's amazing. I love the clean look. I love the aesthetic. I love the design, not just its capability. And that's, uh, you know, there's some uh, pluses to that, to creating physical objects. So I guess, like, what about that distresses you? Well, that most of our, there'll be, you know, there's no legacy per se. The legacy will be mm. in it so much as we touch people's lives, um, that we help people in our craft. And if we can be thought leaders and if the thoughts can live past us. That's pretty much the legacy for digital design. No, but that's also the premise of uh, Barbie, the Barbie movie, it, <laughs> which is like ideas yeah. live forever. Well, oh, they can, <laughs> you know? you don't, no, not necessarily. Oh, yeah, so, they, are, can. they can, yeah. That's true. They can. So that's just something I consider. Yeah, for sure. Well, and, and um, there's, yeah, that tempers a lot of the value I pin to my mm -hmm. job, right? Where, um, for me, I've been uh, deconstructing over the last couple of years my identity with my mm -hmm. profession. And now I'm just like, no, nah, this is just something that gives me dopamine. <laughs> like, I just love, I love yeah, this yeah. career. Like, this is, I just do it because I love mm -hmm. doing it. And, I, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it feels like I'm cheating because it feels easy mm -hmm. to me. That's a good thing. And I'm like, I can't believe they're paying yeah, me to that, do this. Yeah, that's a good yeah. thing because that'll carry you through the tough times, the down times, um, the challenging times. And feed uh the stamina that you need to solve some of these bigger problems now what i would say that i like and as i said i don't know how permanent it is a lot of the things that we work on can have major positive impacts in society so i like that i feel like that's great yes. you know what i mean but that's not a, a a much more level of permanence per se you know what i mean yeah uh, i think people remember brands mm -hmm. right they remember steve jobs i don't think anything he built uh, is in the market but the, his ideas and philosophy mm -hmm. permeate well i know he built apple apple's the, mm -hmm. the thing right the institution and so like the business yeah the institution so i mean yeah i think having something that uh outlives you i just listened to lenny's podcast with uh, i think the deputy cto at microsoft i think that's what his title is and he talked about he invented a uh, uh, cloud-based document, you know, Google Docs, the technology behind oh, wow. Google Docs, and then it got acquired. Yeah, it got acquired by Google, and he technically has the first Google Doc ever made. Oh wow! Um, but he, but he, when he was talking about it, he's like, "Well, yeah, it's like the content is the same because it's just markup, right? But like the UI is different, the back end's different. Like it's not the original, like, you know." Host, hosted server and stuff so there isn't a lot a lot of permanence but the the technology implementation the invention is permanent i think for me i just want to have one like in the and there's a different i i, I just I, I make a distinction between invention and innovation i'm just going to keep inventing inventing mm -hmm. inventing and hopefully have like one or that's two sick. innovations mm -hmm. that yeah that stick right and uh, yeah like the like i want to but in order to get to innovation, you need to get through a lot of bad work. I mean, you think about Da Vinci, there's maybe like one, maybe two yeah. paintings that the lay person remembers of Da Vinci. But dude, that guy put Oh, yeah. They out. have no idea. And and, and uh, I'm going to piggyback on that, too, because I do want to talk about the job market now. But the 
the yes. um, uh, people fail to realize too, and this is kind of how I deal with teams. It's like you have an expert or you have an SME, the head chief craftsman, and then you have a team. Da Vinci didn't do all of it by himself. Couldn't have. There's only, yep. two, only two. David Bowie didn't do it by himself. You know, like it's, how much yeah, could yeah, he yeah. really have painted all by himself? Like, give me a break. So you have to have um, a team. And what he's doing at that point is having that team execute on his vision and teaching them to execute in his style because, you know, the church or whomever, which other patron paid him to do things, wants his style. That's why they came to him. Yeah, they want Da Vinci. Yeah, they man. want Da Vinci. They want, a, they want yeah. Da Vinci. So, you know, I, yeah. I think that's why um, we have a lot of his plans, too, because I don't think he yeah. built all of that himself, the, one, the items that he did build. I do love the adventure part of that. I would say Da Vinci and uh, Ben Franklin have been, I don't think I've told anybody this, Da Vinci and Ben Franklin have been uh, big influences on me because of being polymaths. Yeah. To me, a polymath, me a polymath too, yeah. is a very intriguing concept in human history to have a person that's really good, it's not a jack of all trades, master of none, really good at several things and mastered several things. That to me, mm -hmm. um, uh, helps those individuals to have a larger outsized impact in society and to really leave these legacies that we're talking about of ideas. Yeah. And if you think, and everyone thinks like a polymath is like some kind of genius. It's like, no, like the, the things that like Da Vinci was amazing at, or like, I think, uh, Isambard Kingdom Brunel who made the London, uh, the Great Western Railway and the London uh, Thames uh, mm -hmm. Tunnel, like a tunnel under the Thames River. Um, he like he had he 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 mastered complementary mm -hmm. skill sets mm -hmm. in order to to creative direct his yes. vision. So he was an engineer. But if you look in the book, I have this old I got this from like some used bookstore, his uh, biography. He was also a very phenomenal painter. Mm -hmm. That was his figma. He actually painted, he painted the bridges that he mm -hmm. wanted to like sell yep. the vision of like what it's supposed to pre look like. Pre-visualization. So mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Pre-visualization, which is what we're doing mm -hmm. in Figma. He's able, he was able to uh, lead a team of engineers and like speak to engineering spec. And then he was also good at sales. And, and so that, and that's how he was able to get more commissioned mm -hmm. work. Um, polymaths. If you look at their skills, they're all related Usually. to what kind of impact yeah. a person. And the reason yeah. that is, is because they, uh, this is my take, they are, um, uh, they are seeking synthetic thinking, right? So synthetic thinking is I'm, ta I'm taking parts, putting them together to create something that is greater than the sum total of its parts, true synergy, but it's with mm -hmm. thinking. So it's like, yes. you know, like, and it can be also cumulative skills. So that's how my work has been. You know, I started, uh, I think, uh, music first, actually, and doing digital music production. And then I got into video and then I got into design faster. So then, you know what I mean? I was like, that was a progress for me or, or a progressive, cumulative, adding new things to my skill set that made sense and worked together. And then I could draw on it. So when I was doing interaction design more as an IC and I was doing my animation, I knew timing and I knew rhythm and I knew, you know, I knew all of that because... Yeah, you I had guess. you had a toolbox. Right. You had a toolbox of heuristics right. that you came came from your past skill sets. Similar for me, like started out in like the cinematography, and and that helped uh, when I decided I'm like, oh no, I want to build systems that impact like people's day to day. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, I I do want to get to a topic that yeah, we talked about before about, the, about the, the job market. Um, and I do have a hard stop, so I want to make sure that we cover that. Oh yeah, I so have. I, ha let, I have let's opinions. Talk, let's talk about I have opinions. <laughs> yeah, so let's start yeah, from there. So, yeah. um, you know, people can take this however they want. This is my set of opinion. It seemed coordinated to me. So I even when the uh, twenty twenty one was one of the hottest job markets I had ever seen, starting in the end of twenty twenty. Yeah. Like I've never seen anything like it. People I know had been getting jobs they had never gotten before or even were considered for. Not that they didn't have the skills, they just weren't considered for them. And companies that wouldn't usually consider them because companies opened up remotely. So I thought that was amazing. <clears throat> but what I've seen is that in the layoffs, I f well, I felt like they were coordinated because there was a time there, I want to say end of 2021 and in 2022, last uh, year before last, where 
people were like doing the same exact layoff. We're going like, to do 6%. And, and I mean, I was talking to people, even the packages sounded similar. I'm like, what's going on here? Are the HR groups, did they have a conference or something? Like, this is weird. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, so yeah. that's interesting to me. I thought that that was a little odd. I didn't see a, a I'm always looking for patterns. I didn't really see a, a pattern with job category or group. I uh, saw so product people impacted, designers impacted, executives impacted, developers impacted. So I did not see that. It seemed to be across the board. So I will say that. But now what I think I'm seeing uh, um, starting last year and still continuing is that there was a, a ripple effect from big tech kind of leading the way in those layoffs. And so now other industries are being impacted. But it seemed to be that it was big tech first. And if you look at like layoffs, uh, FYI, or something that tracks layoffs, you'll see the types of companies too. They have categorization of companies and you can look at the timing of it. So I thought that was a little weird that, that the organizations may have been kind of copycatting. And then I've been very attentive to the reasoning given, either on earnings calls or in other public forums. So interest rates. Yeah, I could see that, you know, the companies and institutions were addicted to getting near free money for since like the last crash. <laughs> of course, I mean, you're yeah. going to charge me for money now and I got to refinance my debt. Yeah, that's a that's a big hit. That's not something that's totally in their control. So I buy the interest rate one over hiring. That's where I'm like, OK. So you overhired, you're going to let the people go, you overhired, but none of the people who made the decisions to overhire are being let go. That to me is a red yeah. flag. Like, sorry, some of those people should be gone. Too. And I learned something working in big tech that I had not heard about or known was really happening. And that's the hoarding of talent. So with overhiring, I could see the overhiring, not because of, COVID and, um, you know, uh, uh, certain companies making pledges to minority communities after the wake of George Floyd and all of that, although that's part to play in it as well. But I see this overhiring based on hoarding of talent. There were people that I had heard, and I won't say which companies, that had gotten hired and it took six months to get at a major thing, six months to be assigned to a team. They're getting paid for six months and they have done no work and are doing no work. That's weird to me. I have a friend. I have a friend who was laid off where he was complaining to me because he came from Rally Interactive mm -hmm. that was acquired by Stripe. And for several months at Stripe, he's like, I'm yeah, it's this. weird. He eventually and he eventually got laid off. Mm -hmm. by the way. Yeah. <laughs> so. But I had I had heard that um, someone who had been in that in, the, in at, you know, all big tech their whole career had told me, Mike, it's really talent horny. What they're trying to do is they don't really have projects for these people. They're just trying to deny their they're just bleeding no, the they're market. They're trying to deny their competitor this brain power. And they're uh, willing to pay. Uh, so I'm like, oh, so somebody is reading Sun Tzu Art of War, because <laughs> that makes me feel like that's a, that's a military type strategy. <laughs> that's uh, that's like attrition. Like we're gonna go after our opponents, just wear them down or whatever. But um, that yeah. was great in the era of cheap money. As interest rates rose, then that pop that strategy probably came back to vitamin a butt. So I could see that a little bit, but I think it's overplayed. The overhiring was overplayed. And then what I'm disconcerted about was uh, this is just what I've seen speaking to other minorities and people that are part of the affinity groups is that it seems, and this is a seeming, that it's the the first uh, what is it last hire first fired scenario where a lot of minorities who were not at these big fang companies finally got a chance and got in, and they were in the first wave or second wave of layoffs. And so there's a lot of like, you know, great. And then those of us who are more cynical were probably like, saw that coming. I could, I mean, I, saw, I mean, like you have your business have been around for 30 years. You didn't know that there were qualified black and Latinos this whole time. It took the George Floyd incident for yeah. you to recognize that. That's kind of weird to me. So that's probably a thing. But what I'm really just concerned about is lately the excuse of using AI. AI is not even, I don't know of any major org that's truly including Microsoft, maybe, that has truly deployed this throughout the whole org. Case in point, say your company is like, we're on the Microsoft business suite. We're going to pay the extra, get co-pilot, do what we need to do. Everybody in the company has. How does that translate into tw uh, 200 people need to go? Then? What? Because I have an AI writer in Word? Give me a break. I'm not buying that. That's just more cover to me. And then, you know, we have to not be naive about how Silicon Valley in particular works. So when you you know, depending on the tier of the person and the RSU package and compensation, this may 
this may allow for more RSUs to be around and then stock buybacks and prop up the valuation of the stock. There's all kinds of the things that can go on there. So I do think that some of this is it. Um, you know, there, there are some people I know I've spoken to, they've said, well, maybe it's, you know, uh, the workers really push for a lot. I don't think so, but the, the workers push for some things during the COVID time period, higher, uh, higher pay, uh, more flexibility with work, remote work. And so this is, um, executive and management pushing back. And the easiest way to do that is to create surplus labor, essentially scare everybody back into the office and taking lower paychecks in a nutshell. So that's obviously people would say that's a cynical look at it, but as in, you know, as I said, someone who studies our species, that doesn't sound off to me, you know? Uh, and if we don't believe that um, uh, leaders uh, view themselves as a class or a group, all we have to do is look at um, events at Davos at Sun Valley. You know, I wasn't invited. I don't know any designers yeah. invited to Sun Valley. To the bill to the billionaire mm -hmm. outings, just saying. Yeah, like crew, crews rule the world, right? Like people talk about, um, you know, diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of background, um, diversity of a yeah. lot of different things. But um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, the uh, it, uh, movies is a great example. Uh, Christopher Nolan's working with the same people. Every yeah, time. exactly. Because like bankable yeah. people you know like that's the yeah. term bankable right like set so, like you, a safe bet yeah you try to mitigate risk um, you're always trying and, to mitigate yeah. risk but some of uh some of it uh, what we've seen is the <clears throat> the problems that they the same leaders created especially in any concept of yeah. over hiring like you didn't know that i will tell you i was very surprised and i try to listen to anytime uh especially big tech leaders give uh, interviews and things of that nature i was surprised that Many of them thought the highs and the peaks that they had during COVID was the new, was the new standard or the new level their stock would stay at going forward. That's crazy to me. It's like, do you, have you ever read history at all? Have you, do you, did you take it in school? Like, are you joking? So to me, that was just bad planning. They should have known that that was a peak and they should have said, we don't know where, if this means that there's a new high or not for our stock and we should be careful. And that would be a, that would be using yeah. wisdom. And I just didn't see that it was short-term gain and dare I say some greed that drove these decisions. Yeah. Sounds like, you know, a tragedy of the commons mm -hmm. scenario. So, you know, just like since, since we've distributed all the money, no one has mm -hmm. accountability anymore. And so the, I think to wrap up, um, I guess. Like, what are you looking for? I know that you, as of recording this, you're already starting to think about your next move. Um, what are you looking for in a company? Oh man, that's a great one. Uh, what, as when you're evaluating yeah, players. So first yeah. off, as a as a craftsperson, I'm looking for interesting problems to solve. I'm looking for problems that yeah. have meat on the bone uh, that will have a big impact at that company or organization, and can have a big social impact preferably. Um, that that gets me going in the morning. Uh, for companies, I'm looking at companies where they have a culture that's focused on the outcomes and the output and not politic. Politic can be acidic and it can be corrosive. And yes, we're a social animal and we'll always have politic, but it's like, we're professionals. Like, focus, 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 focus. Well, yeah, hey. maybe, I think for me, it's like how corporate they are, yeah, well, I think, right? Like how dogmatic know, are they are about yeah, hierarchy yeah. and people keep, yeah. people do use that as a, and as a, uh, as a way to describe it. Um, but that would be it for me. And then, um, honesty, uh, and transparency goes a very long way with me because I try to be an honest, upfront and transparent person. So, we, you know, if you're not in a good way and you tell me that and I'm, we're talking about a, uh, an opportunity and you're saying and you're being honest about that, that goes a long way with me. Because then it lets us, everyone know where they stand and it lets you know what you're in for and the type of problem solving you'll need to do to help them get to a better position. Yeah. So what I'm hearing here is that um, you should align uh, uh, with something that, that you value. You know, I think all of us at the end of the day, um, if, if you're an mm -hmm. artist, right, a craftsperson, 
you know, uh, try to go to companies that interest you because uh, you get get that dopamine, mm-hmm. you get that rush. It's fun. Like do do things that like mm-hmm. seem like fun, um, and work on fun things because you know everything's mm-hmm. temporary and, and so, interest, not just fun and, and, and let, like interesting, right? You know, yeah, what I mean? like interesting, interesting to you. Yeah. So like for me, I want to I yes. want to be working on it. You know, some in some capacity AI projects. I want to be have the capability to do test and learn. I want to have the capability to um, proper properly evaluate, um, you know, uh, problem statements and things of that nature, and make sure that we're going the right direction. But you know, agile, like good luck. But I think most companies think they're more agile than they are, and I'm not saying agile is the agile is the end all be all. I do know that there's a definitive reason since I've been around since Waterfall. I, there, I know the definitive reasons for it. So that's a good thing too. Can, you know, do, do they have in their D? De- oh, here's another thing. Innovation. I'm a fan of it. I understand every company is not an innovation company or is, and it's big on that. Some of them can't do that by the nature of the type of products and services they offer. But that having that type of thinking, it really invigorates the entire staff. You gotta have something that excites people. Even if we know that's a 10 year play or that's a, you know, Hail Mary or, you know, that's blue sky. You got to do some of that. <laughs> well, I, yeah. What's your what's your what's your definition? Of innovation. Of For innovation. me, it would be unique, um, unique ways to solve a problem, unique and interesting ways to solve a problem, not novelty. I think people mix innovation and novelty. That's not what I mean. I mean, mm-hmm. it. Novelty yeah, invention. I, I like that. I like invention, but I like uh, looking at a problem, different perspective, like kind of like a Rubik's cube, turning it and looking at every facet, and then coming with a different way and a unique way to solve that problem that will have a bigger impact. So once again, trying to gain some synergy, making the sum total of the parts um, create an impact that's bigger than the parts. Yeah, yeah, like the. Uh... For me, innovation, uh, there's like a great book called How Innovation mm-hmm. Works. And basically, uh, innovation at a first principles, it's actually a pretty mm-hmm. like low, uh, uh, a low bar. Like it's, it, it, you just need to make g- getting access to something or uh, either, you know, two times cheaper or uh, to like, you, you just either make it more accessible, yeah. cheaper. There are some buckets. Yeah, there's uh, some faster. buckets. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's like, okay, what's like using a novel of a way to make something faster. So like streaming, uh, was an innovation. Now mm-hmm. it's the status quo, but like streaming was like, Oh cool. I don't have to drive to a blockbuster to get this thing. And I don't I could, have like to watch have it right now. DVDs everywhere. I did. Yeah. I could have a smaller house cause I don't need to hoard stuff. Well, no one's doing that. Um, well, no one's doing innovation. that in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know yeah. what you're saying. Oh, no, Texas would be like, I need a bigger house with more stuff. But yeah, um, I, I get I get what yeah. you're saying there. No, it's just also too, innovation can be how a business grows. Like I've seen I, what I think is very interesting. I've seen other like how Berkshire Hathaway used to be like a furniture store that turned into like this insane investment. Plan. That is interesting and innovative to me or companies who, mm-hmm. after d- doing very well in their space, gain so much data that they now have a data play. They can sell data. They can help build LLMs. Like that's innovative to me. I love that. Yeah, you get you get innovate the, the business yes. model. Like get like increase yes. revenue through adjusting how you deliver yes. value to the the market. Yeah, and so in order to do that, you you can't really tie your um you can't tie your identity mm-hmm. to the discipline, right? And this is what I've been railing on is that um. Anyone that says that like design thinking is dead or that like they're trying to like evangelize the value of like uh, traditional user interface design, I I see those people as like, hey, they were they came into the interaction design field from like maybe graphic Mm -hmm. design or something. And like they're doing it because it's 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 more lucrative than being Mm -hmm. a graphic designer. And they're they identify themselves by Mm -hmm. the discipline rather than what they can do with the discipline or becoming multidisciplinary, right? right? And this goes back to the polymath thing where it's like, you know, you care more about the outcome. 
I, you know, for me, it's like if the rest of my career or like the next 10 years of my career is going to design critique with like uh, AI mm. prompts that I think could like finish my customer's sandwich, uh, sentences. I was about to say sandwiches. That was a frozen <laughs> reference. The, uh, yeah, I, I have kids. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, well, actually, Gus, Gustav Sunderstam, uh, the head, like the CTO, mm -hmm. CPO, like everything te like tech at uh, Spotify, he was, he's having, uh, designers bring prompts to a critique or, or at least that's what they're doing. I don't think he's having, I think his VP oh. of the experience is doing that. Be like our engineers are demoing uh, prompt and engineering. And uh, if that's the rest of my career, it and won't be. Like, then it I'm just using no, U it's, UI. It's our current phase of yeah. Gen AI where we yeah. are having to change the way we speak to get the best output from the system. The system should get eventually smart enough to understand and infer what we mean without us having to change the way we speak. Now, we can always ask for clarification yeah. if you're too broad, right? We have a tendency to do that. Yeah. So we can ask for clarification. But the, I would think the goal of these systems is not to have it to where we need to learn a whole new language again, because then that's just like low level code, because that's what coding language is, is speaking to mm -hmm. these machines. So it's like. Yeah. Prompt engineering is like natural language. Yeah. Programming. And it's like, no, I mean, that's why I'm, yeah. the rabbit was so intriguing because it was just using regular everyday language and inferring it properly based on the demo. Now, when we have them in hand, then we will test it and see. Yeah, I'd love to hear what you learned. Um, and you're always welcome to come back on the show to talk about what you learned. Um, I I uh, really enjoy like your perspective on the industry and uh, your leadership. Um, I think what I got out of this interview uh, and I think any listener that's really actually trying to be impactful with their work, um, like it's not about the discipline of like interaction design or user interface design. Um, it's like, okay, don't think about how, think about what. Because if you think about how, you're gonna you're just gonna pull from your biases of your yeah. experience and what you can do. And so if you ask an engineer, you know, like, hey, how, uh, like how should we get, how do we get to this outcome? They're always going to just be, oh, let's just build everything custom, right? Because they're an engineer, like they want to do right. it perfect. Mm -hmm. and, and so like, but you, there's an existing technology you could just buy, right? And so mm -hmm. instead of thinking about how, always think about what and why first and uh, be willing to not let the discipline drive the decision. No, but like no, your no, no, actual no. critical analysis. Yes, yeah, you have to be you really know? pragmatic. Hey, yeah, I appreciate you for coming on and, uh, you know, taking ex extra time to like, share your opinions. So thanks Thank so much. Thank you. Yeah, good one. Take care. Bye.